Well, Shabbat Shalom. I'd like to thank Rabbi Kevin for that set of praise and worship. Um, we should be encouraged all the time, and we should be reminded all the time of who we are and why we're here, because we forget. So today, we come to our little Mishkan to be reminded of exactly that, who we are, why we're here, and who our shield is. So this was an extremely difficult teaching for me. Normally my teachings are prepared weeks in advance. This one was prepared and finished yesterday because I don't move unless the Lord moves me. Um, getting a little nervous there, but uh, I think he has a great message for us. And may his words speak to you and may mine fall silent. So I called Rabbi Aaron yesterday and I, or Thursday, and I said, this is really bothering me, but I cannot come up with a title for this teaching. I've never, ever had this problem before where I cannot summarize what it is that I want to speak on in a title. So I told him the main points. I told him what it was about. And he says, well, I got one. So I used his suggestion. And it's called Following in the Footsteps of the Unseen. And that, by definition, is faith. Our faith. Well, some of you have never heard me speak before, and others of you have. Those that have know that I always start my teachings with questions. And by the end of the teaching, hopefully, God willing, those questions are answered. This is a teaching of questions. There will be questions that will guide us throughout. But keeping in tradition, I will start with my traditional questions. Simple ones, why are we here? What is the meaning of life? What is the value of life? Just some light topical issues that we'll go through in the next, everybody's looking at their watch. <laughs> I promise you that by the end of this teaching, these questions and the whys and the hows will be answered. You all heard, except for you guys out in the World Wide Web, uh, during our uh, praise and prayer session before we start streaming, if you've noticed a common theme, there were so many prayer requests for people considering suicide. Yeah. There's a desperation out there a deep-seated desperation. And it's a void in people's lives because they've pulled away from God. And despair has set in. So if you ever wondered why we're here, the answer's love. The answer's love. There's people hurting out there that need us. So where does that leave us? Well. It leaves us with a huge task, and that is to deal with ourselves, to get ourselves into a position where we can be useful to God, that we can reflect his light to a dark and dying world. That's why we gather. That's why we're here today. So today, if you would, um, go ahead, open your scriptures, to, if you have them, to the book of Genesis. So we'll start in the beginning and work all the way through. I love you all. Okay. So, we start in the book of Genesis today, the Torah. The Torah is poorly defined as law. The book of law. Torah is better defined as instruction. It is a book of instruction. God 
does not leave us high and dry. He gives us a book of instructions. When my daughter was born, I asked the doctor for the instruction manual. He says, there is none. You're on your own. Good luck. God doesn't do that. So in this book of instruction, we see things based on where we are in our relationship with God. The closer we draw to God, the better we see. The more we see, the more he can show us, the more he can speak to us. That's why scripture is called living. Because we can read this book inside and out, year after year, and every time we open it, we see something new. It's living because we're living, because we're changing, because we're growing. Now, if you say, well, you know, I read this thing, I don't really get much, well, then perhaps you're a bit stagnant and should look in the mirror. We've said from this pulpit many times, the scripture is a mirror. So we don't want to look at it as people who lived a long time ago, long since gone. No. The people we read about are not only our family, because when we came to faith, guess what, guys? We were grafted in. This is our family. The, the pictures you see around are representations of our family. We're part of something huge, the body of Christ. So, as Rabbi Aaron alluded early on, God gives us pictures and examples to live by and warnings as well. And all of these are in here. The menorah, a beautiful picture of God's roadmap. And if you uh, would like a permanent copy, you can get that out on the web uh, in our writings. There is a roadmap of the menorah and the different feasts they represent, the seven sticks, the feasts that were covered in the first coming, and the feasts that will be covered in the second coming. So God gives us all kinds of pictures and examples of what he's going to do, what his plan for humanity is. Why? Because God desires communion with us. The book of Genesis. We're going to overview part of this book. So in Genesis 1, you don't necessarily have to, sorry, you don't necessarily have to turn there. But in Genesis 1, God, the source of all life, speaks everything into existence. He creates an environment, a perfect environment. He creates elements, the sun, the moon, the stars, day, night. He creates man and he creates woman. What I want to illustrate here in the beginning is who our God is, who our shield is, who it is that we should place our trust and our undevoted life, love, and attention to. Okay, so God speaks life into existence. In Genesis 2 and 2, on the seventh day, God rests from creating, and he makes that day holy. Now, from a kingdom-minded heart's perspective, who did God do all this for? Us. God created this environment for his creation, man and woman. The days and the nights, the mornings and the evenings, the seasons, these were all things that God created so that man could flourish in the environment that he created for his creation. So creation itself is an amazing portrait painted by God so that mankind could live and flourish in this new environment. I think most of you would agree with me that Scripture tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, did he stop giving pictures back in Genesis? 
Did he stop giving examples and instruction for us to live in his environment? The days, the nights, the mornings and the evenings. A secular-minded perspective on this debates a 24-hour day. Well, they don't answer the question that I just asked earlier. Who did God do this for? Who did God create this creation for? He created it for man. Does God need millions of years to create? No, he speaks it into existence. But a secular-minded perspective would say, no way. That's impossible. If there is a God, it would have taken millions of years, not days, and it would have needed some random cosmic event to kick things off. This is a weak God that people have created by their own minds and their own image that cannot do. But we serve a God that can. This is not our God that they describe. They place their faith in science that is based on observation and chance. The scientific method is a framework for determining what is factual. It's based on observation, which is empirical evidence. They formulate hypothesis, which is a proposed explanation of what it is they've observed. They apply deductive reasoning, and they perform experiments to try to prove or disprove what it is that they have observed and made a hypothesis about. Then based on their findings, they come to a conclusion and call that fact. Now, God gifted many minds with great intellect. And that great intellect is a gift if that intellect is devoted to God, not to man. It's got to go one way or another. We all have this choice. Both science and faith in the living God are faiths. It's where we put our trust. Science is a faith that requires proof in what can be seen, while faith in God requires trust in the unseen. So, where do we invest the resources of our mind? It's very, very difficult for a scientist, a man of science or a woman of science, to come to faith because they want to see and they want to prove and they want to experiment and come to conclusions and they want to check the boxes. But faith is walking in the unseen. There is a, a, an ancient saying, if you will, covered in the dust of my rabbi, which simply means that I am following so closely to God that I am covered in his dust. But we don't see this. Years ago, we lost a child, my wife and I. And this one doctor said the most profound thing that has stuck to me, stuck with me even to this day. He said, I'm a man of medical science, but God is the healer. I'm simply his instrument. A man of medical science with a scientific type mind had the heart for God. A beautiful combination of intellect and faith. Continuing. By Genesis 3, the fall has happened. God performed the first animal sacrifice. Did he perform the first animal sacrifice simply to clothe the nakedness of our forefather and foremother, Adam and Eve? Or did he create and paint the first picture or example of what was needed to recover dominion, conquer death, 
and restore communion with God. Scripture is full of paintings, portraits, examples, and warnings. So, if you would, turn with me to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to her, his brother Abel. Now Abel kept the flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the first fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor upon Abel in his offering, but on Cain in his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. What is right? Will you not? Uh... Oh, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, and it desires to have you, but you must master it. So, God accepted Abel's gift, but not Cain's. Why? Oh, well, there's one of those whys. Both of these boys worship God, and they wanted his approval. Both of these boys were taught by the same parents, Adam and Eve. Both spoke directly with God, as their parents did. Well, it's boils down to a matter of the heart. It's obvious from the text that Abel's heart was righteous and Cain's heart was not. It was troubled. It was not right. Well, it's that troubling heart, that troubled heart that we want to look at today. It's a matter of the heart. So again, Scripture being a mirror, why was Cain angry? Why did he feel the need to kill his brother? How did this happen? Why did this happen? It kind of falls in line with those prayer requests this morning. There's a despair here. Where did it come from and how did it set in? How could it possibly set in? Well, if you turn all the way over to the book of Jude which is the book just before Revelation. The book of Jude gives us insight as to what and why and how this happened. <clears throat> Jude chapter 1, verse 1. Oh, there's only one chapter in Jude, so we're, we're, we're good. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, <clears throat> to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write you about the salvation we share, I felt that I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our Lord God into a license for immorality and to deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. 
In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand. And what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning, unreasonable animals, these are the very things that destroy them. So skip down to verse 14, where it says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all those ungodly of all the ungodly acts that they have done in an ungodly way. And all of the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and they flatter others for their own advantage. So here, Jude gives us a little more insight into the heart of Cain. He not only describes Cain's heart, but he accurately and effectively describes the world around us today. With a promise of judgment for the wicked. So as we labor along and we struggle and we, we try to figure out why it appears that the ungodly prosper, that's not for us to touch. It's not for us to judge. That's for God. We don't ever want to put ourselves in his place. But be assured, the promise of God from the book of instruction says the unjust will be judged. The unjust will be punished. There is picture after picture after picture of this assurance. But that's not what we're here for. So, influenced by temptation, just like their their, his parents before him. Whatever those temptations were, sin entered his mind, or the temptation itself entered his mind and was considered by Cain. It resided in his heart. It traveled from a thought to a heart issue with him and eventually consumed him. This is the architecture of sin. This is what sin looks like to each and every one of us. This is how it happens. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, take every thought captive. Why? Because it sure is a lot easier to pull up a weed when it first sprouts than when it's taken over the whole yard. Amen. Come on. There we go. Book of Jude. That's where we are. So, even when God explains, Cain neither listens nor understands what's being told to him. Like his master, Cain's mind, his heart, and his reasoning had become corrupted. Hearkening back to the time of creation, God gives his people, you and I, pictures, examples, warnings, and promises, and they're all guaranteed to be paid in full based on our relationship with him. We said earlier on that we pretty much agree God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not going to change. And that we can bank on. In our day of uh, instant everything, we tend to simplify our perception. We have a tendency to try to categorize everything, to answer all the questions, to check all the boxes. Everything from diet to our jobs to how we relax and play. We try to put everything into a nice, neat package. We live in a society that demands that everything be done immediately. We read scripture and we want to glean what we can, 
But when we consider what is truly said and we apply it to our lives, this can take a lifetime. Patience. Walking in faith requires patience. It is a virtue, and it is a virtue that many of us lack. We want things so quickly. The Bible uses the term talent. The Old Testament and the New Testament, you see this word talent. It was a measurement of currency that was used before coins showed up in about 200 B.C. So before coins, you had a talent of precious metal, and you would chip off, shave off some of that precious metal and use it as currency. Okay, so a talent is 75 to 100 pounds of precious metal, either gold, silver, or bronze. In Numbers 1, 50 through 51, it tells us that the Levites were responsible for the movement of the tabernacle, the Mishkan, in the wilderness. But do we, ask, do we actually grasp the enormity of this task that these men performed? They were responsible for the assembly, the disassembly, and the moving of the Mishkan every time God said, move. I firmly believe, and this is not factual, it's just my belief, but I firmly believe that the Levites were the inventors of the word oi. <laughs> I told you guys that was in my teaching. They didn't believe me. The tabernacle. In Exodus 25 and 39, we are told that the lampstand, the menorah that was in the tabernacle, alone by itself was made from one talent of gold. So the lampstand weighed 75 to 100 pounds. Just the lampstand. In total... There were 30 talents of gold in the tabernacle. There was 100 talents of silver. And there were 70 talents of bronze. Not to mention all the wooden poles, the animal skins, and the materials that went along with it. Total this up, you do the math, we're about 10 tons of weight in the tabernacle in the wilderness. And guess what? There were no paved roads when they had to move this thing. Oi. <laughs> so the reason I bring this up is just to give us a more realistic or a better perspective on where we are going next. Next, I'd like you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 18. In verse 23, now, <clears throat> I see a bunch of red letters here. So we know Yeshua is speaking. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And he began the settlement. A man who owed him 10,000 talents, yeah, ooh, was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children, and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown in prison until he could pay the debt. 
When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants just as I have had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Again, instruction for us to live by. Insurmountable debt and an attitude of a corrupted heart. This is the portrait I'm looking at in, this, in these verses here. But it's not some person long ago. This is me. He's writing about me. He's talking, Yeshua is talking about me. Like Cain, the servant's reasonable, reasoning abilities had been corrupted. Yet he did not understand this to be true even when it was explained to him. Are you starting to see a pattern here? And there are many, many examples throughout Scripture of this pattern. So if we were to take that scientific method and apply it here, observing the patterns and applying some deductive reasoning that it's not just dead people from long ago, it's me too, we observe the outcome is the same over and over again. The path of death. Sin is leading the, to the path of death. So a conclusion can be drawn that unless we avoid the ways of Cain, the cumulative influence of temptation and sin, we too will perish. So we've got a matter of the heart and an insurmountable debt that we owe the creator of the universe. Turn with me now to, over to chapter 25 and verse 14. Jesus again, Yeshua again speaking. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. He gave each, he gave one five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received only one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. Here is what belongs to you. His master said, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I had not sown and gathered where I had not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, if God's the same yesterday, 
today and forever. That sounds like a warning to me. That sounds like a commission to me. It sounds like instruction of what God expects from us as children of faith. So, it's another example of matters of the heart. We had two guys who took not a little bit of money. Even the servant that received one talent, that's a hundred pounds of gold. Okay, he didn't receive a little bit. He received a lot. Each of us are gifted with talents. Different areas. We call them anointings. Take that anointing and invest it. Grow it. Develop it. Because as you do, more will be given to you. Then when it comes time and you stand face to face with Yeshua, when I stand face to face with Yeshua, I have something to show for what he gave me, what he's gifted me. This is our responsibility. We can't point the fingers. Now, by today's standards, by the way, all right, if you took a talent and assumed, okay, 75 pounds of gold, 75 pounds of gold is worth $1.8 million. 100 pounds of gold is worth $2.4 million. So that, that servant that received just one talent didn't even realize what he had. We're millionaires. Just with what God has given us in his mercy. So, even the servant that had the one talent received much. It's not how much we receive, it's what we do with it that counts. Turn with me to 1 John 3 and 11. That's just before Jude. It's just before 2 John, too. So 1 John chapter 3, and verse 11. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brother, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we, have, because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid his life down for us, and we ought to lay our lives down for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. So the first main Ingredient is love. But it's not just what we think love is. It's not the conclusion of love that we've based on an observation of a broken home life. This is love based on God. It's what scripture calls agape love. Unconditional love from the Father. Regardless of our earthly circumstances, we need to focus and observe the correct source to make our determinations and to make our conclusions of how we are going to live our lives. It's a matter of eternal life or death. See, Yeshua on the cross conquered death. Well, that means that there is an eternity for each and every one of us. Believer, unbeliever alike. Where are we going to spend that eternity? So, 
Yeshua sums up the law and the prophets by saying, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love people. So we're given instruction on how to live in this environment, what's important. And don't mix the order up. We can't love people first. We have to love God first because we can't give out what we don't have. If we do, it'll be an imitation, a fraud. I'd like to share with you something that I've never shared with anybody else ever. Not even my wife, no one. I grew up in a family where my parents were forever married. They loved Jesus. They were a true example of what Christians should be. And yet, as I grew up, I realized there was a void in me. I knew I was supposed to love. And I would act in love and do loving things. But I was missing, I was devoid of compassion. That stuck with me my entire life up until maybe a handful of years ago when I realized that I was trying to do what I thought I should be doing and not doing what God has gifted me with. When I humbly approached God on this matter, He gifted me with what I was missing. The hole in my heart that I never knew, I never understood, I did not know how to fix, He did. And it was at that point that I realized that of myself, you're going to get sarcasm, you're going to get jocularity, you're going to get some kindness, thank God, but there's this sarcastic, angry side that can, that can erupt. That's me. But when God is reflecting through me, when I allow God to reflect through me, miracles happen. And I realize more and more and more, I realize that when I fall down on the job, when I don't draw close to God, that reflection draws dim. My position of strength is an indefensible, is that the word? Undefensible position? Indefensible? It's on my knees. When you are on your knees, you can't defend yourself. You can be attacked from all different sides. And guess what? You will be. But that's where we're strong. Reflecting him, not reflecting us, reflecting him. Remember that sarcasm I mentioned? Investment. So we talked about this insurmountable debt. Now we're going to talk a little bit about investment. How do we tune our hearts to be in communion with God, to draw ever closer to the source of life eternal? Investments. Where do we invest our time and our interest in? There are people in this world who can quote you every sports statistic on the planet. I don't know. I've read some books on sports statistics that take a lot of time to gather all that, but they can do it. Then, the other side of the coin, there are people who live alone in marriages with very little communication. They're grapes dying on the vine. Both are examples of people who invest their time and their interest in what's most important to them aside from God. 
those people that can quote those stats, ask them to quote a verse. Ask them to give a hug. Ask them to give something spiritually meaningful at the time when you are in despair. You might get some topical answer, but there's no depth because the relationship is not there. Love and compassion, empathy and understanding, and caring can only come from God. We can't give what we don't have. Trust me, I lived this life for most of my life. He gave me my beautiful wife to teach me where I was lacking. He's given us our family here at the Mishkan to teach me how to fill that hole where I was lacking, how to approach God, how to draw close to God. Because in the end, we will stand face to face with Yeshua and we will take and have to give account. If we hear, well done, good, faithful servant, we're saved. Not till then. Till then, we're on the path of salvation. We, this path of salvation, we've said from this pulpit many times, is drawing closer and closer to God. So that at the day where we give account, we have gold to give. To commune with God, we have to invest our heart, our mind, our will, and our interest in God. God will not leave us nor forsake us. Seems I've read that somewhere. Oh, it's in the book of instruction. Bank on that. He is our shield. He is our source and our strength. So, has he given you one talent? Has he given you five? It doesn't matter. Do with that. Grow in God and more will be added. So, why are we here? Why are we here in this room today? Churches, churches should be hospitals at the very least. Not places of entertainment, but hospitals. Because we're all broken. We're all in need of healing. I've always said for years that the Mishkan here is like a mash unit. We're small and it's messy. But it's okay because we all need to heal. We all need to draw close to the source of that healing. So what is the value of that lonely marriage or that head full of sports knowledge? I do not want for me a corrupted Cain's heart telling me I'm okay and everything's fine only to hear my Lord one day say, I never knew you. That scares the hell out of me. Hopefully. For the rest of my life, may I ever increase in my investment, in my relationship with my Lord and Savior. Wasted time is lost time. Forget about it. Yesterday's gone. We have today. It's a new opportunity to invest in the internal. Strengthen your faith. Grow your relationship with Yeshua. The kingdom currency is time. I hear people say, oh, I wish Yeshua would return. That scares me. I'm not ready. I don't know that the people saying it are actually ready. Because if you... Well, if you looked in that mirror, you might not make those statements. Time allows us to draw close to the Lord to build this relationship. Investing our time and heart properly can revive that ailing marriage and redirect that fanaticism towards something useful for the kingdom. You know, you look at sports fans and they're doing the wave and... You know, they're yelling and screaming, they're painting their face and doing all kinds of funny things. But you know, a lot of that fanaticism is birthed out of anointings. There's a zeal. Zeal is really cool because zeal for God is so effective. 
zeal for sports. Your team is good this year. Next year, they're not so good. When Jesus stands before you and you stand before him, he's not going to say, gee, what happened to your team back there in the 80s? No, 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 no. No value there. You're investing in dirt. Now, it's not to say that you can't go and watch a game and have some entertainment. Nothing wrong with any of that. But it's where we put our heart. We're going to close here with the Gospel of Luke. Okay, Luke chapter 15 and verse 3. Again, there's those red letters. Yeshua is speaking. <clears throat> then Yeshua told him this parable. Suppose that one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls all of his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Hmm. Anytime Yeshua says, I'll tell you, Time to listen. So he's saying, this is the way it is. That's a promise. We're all broken and susceptible to temptation like Adam and Eve were. The power we possess in humble repentance is our greatest weapon against the ways of Cain. It's our greatest investment tool. Abba Vasilius said, as for the practical expression of love, I think that the greatest help and the greatest expression of love that we can give everyone is to sanctify our own vessel. This is why when someone repents, he becomes a sign of hope for the whole world. You have heard that when the forest is destroyed in South America, oxygen is lost throughout the world. If one person repents, if one person receives the grace of God, he supplies oxygen of life and hope to the entire world. May we be those who invest our hearts in God, recognizing our insurmountable debt that we owe, and draw ever near to him, the source of eternal life, and be a sign of hope to a dark and dying world. Now, normally I would have just closed there, but for you guys, and for you guys at home, Homework. Oh. Oh, oi. 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 If you're having trouble, if you're struggling with your faith, if you are looking for a lifeline, if there's despair, make some hot cocoa, coffee or tea, whatever you like, and find a quiet place and read Romans 8. Let it sink in and listen what, to what the Holy Spirit has to say to you. Amen. Amen. Shalom. Remember to do your homework.